Hello fellow choral directors, I'm Micah Bland and welcome to episode 20 of Choral Ed. Today in this episode I am excited to share with you some general suggestions on sight reading and solfege. But before we get into today's episode, I hope you would take a moment to hit that like and subscribe button and share your favorite Choral Ed episode with a friend. So talking about some general techniques for including sight reading and solfege in the classroom. The first aspect is I hope that you're including these skills of sight reading in all aspects of rehearsal. That includes the warm-up time, a dedicated sight reading time, and during your rehearsal repertoire. So that in warm-up, it doesn't have to be the entire warm-up is all solfege, but that we include certain solfege exercises. For, uh, in my teaching, I use uh, Exercises that were difficult intervals. Do, so, do, fa, fa, la, do. I knew fa, la, do was difficult for my bass section, and so I had them do that exercise quite a bit. You might also have um, the exercise, I love to sing. All right, well, that starts on so. Can you sing that on solfege? So, fa, mi, re, do. Simple things like this, where they are including some solfege and sight reading techniques in the warm-up time. Uh, our next episode will feature a guest who will talk about some vocal warm-ups and how to use sight reading and solfege in those warm-ups. So I hope you look forward to that guest uh, speaker for our next episode. We also have the dedicated sight reading time and I truly hope that you are including that in every rehearsal, that we don't skip that time. That is such an important aspect of our students' development as far as it goes with sight reading. And then lastly, I hope you're including sight reading and solfege during the rehearsal of the repertoire that you are going to perform for your concert. That the sequence is we learn it on solfege, we sight read it on solfege, we then move to a neutral syllable like ooh or ah, and then we finish off and learn the text finally. And so the, the purpose of sight reading is that we can sight read music. And so why do we then, as teachers, teach our repertoire on rote by rote, having them sing it back on text, when we're trying to get them to be music musically literate and sight read this music? And so I strongly encourage you to have those students sight read that music on solfege. We as teachers also have some bad habits when it comes to teaching sight reading and solfege. The first is that we sing with our students. So I hope you would avoid singing during the sight reading process and the whole rehearsal that we avoid singing with them. Students become very reliant on us because student singers are very good at listening and adjusting quickly to what they hear. They also might not sing as loud. They might kind of be quieter to hear you as the leader singing and you produce most of the sound and they are then relying on you and they have to work less. One of our themes today is that students, when we give them too much support, we work harder and they work less. And that's, it should be the opposite. They should work harder and we should work less. We should not have to sing and do all these extra things. So avoid singing with your students during the sight reading time. Also avoid pointing. If it's on the board, as you point along, this might seem a little odd. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, the issue is we're giving the rhythm. Do, do, re, mi, re. I'm just giving all the rhythm. You don't have to think about the rhythm because they're gonna follow your cue of what that rhythmic pulse is. This is also true when it comes to showing hand signs. So the third bad habit we have as teachers is showing the hand signs. So when I show the hand signs, do, do, re, mi, I've just given uh, the rhythmic values. If it's on the board and they're, they're reading it off a board and you're going along, well, they don't need to look at the board. They, you're giving them all the answers, right? Do, do, why have to figure out what the solfege is when the answers are right there, given by the teacher, both pitch and rhythm. Uh, when they're looking at their music and they have a sheet music, I once was showing hand signs 
uh, back in the day, these were my bad habits as well, that uh, one of the students was so trying to get the right answers, he was a newer student, and I appreciate that he was trying, but he wasn't even looking at his music at all. He was just copying my hand signs as fast as he could, and then I stopped, and he goes, oh, he didn't know we were where we were in the music. He was totally lost, right? So as soon as I stopped showing the hand signs. And so just be mindful that you showing the hand signs can be a distraction and giving them too much information and giving them the answers instead of having them work harder and provide you with the answers. When we stop in rehearsal and during a sight reading exercise and want to restart, we again give them too much help and support. We say, all right, measure two, establish your key. Do, mi, so, mi, do, so, do. Your first note is re, you play it. Re, re, sing it, re, right? That's way too much information. Number one, we don't need to re-establish the key every time we stop. I've seen that before. We don't need to give them the pitch. We stop and say, all right, measure two, think your pitch. So we're practicing audiation. Sing measure two. Re, re, mi, fa. Maybe they get the wrong note. Okay, well, this is a teaching moment. All right, no, wrong note, wrong starting note. Think again, hold your first pitch. Re, and they find it and they readjust and they develop that skill. I could easily go, nope, wrong note. Re, here it is, sing it, re. We do these things to move rehearsal along but we give them the answers. They're no longer having to think as much because we're giving them way too much support. This is also very helpful when you get to your rehearsal music and you say, all right, do it again. You don't need to play notes again. I, I do this often at the collegiate level. We just go back to measure five. Boom, go, right? Oh, do that again. I don't have to give pitches every time. I don't have to have the accompanist give pitches every time. We train them to internalize these pitches as we move back. So now, sometimes if you're starting a new section, okay, we have to give them starting pitches. That's understandable. You can't do it every time. But this moves rehearsal along and this develops their audiation skills. When we make corrections during sight reading, uh, we often, again, want to give them too much support and so we just give them the answers. All right, there was a mistake in measure two. It goes re, re, mi, fa, or we sing it, we play it. Well, we just gave them all the answer, have them try it again. If it's still wrong, well, we isolate then the mistake. Maybe it was Ray to me. All right, sing this note. Ray, sing this note. Me again. Ray, me. Sing measure two. Ray, Ray, me, fa. And so we isolate that instead of, here's the answer. Do this, right? And I shouldn't be showing the hand signs while I'm doing that. I should be conducting. Uh, but, these are the ways that we can develop their skills instead of just giving them the answer. So often we're in a rush, we want them to get it right, and so we just, here you go, here's the answer. Sing this, do this instead. Nope, do, do, fa, do, so, do, fa. I said that wrong probably the first time. And so I really encourage you to try these things. It takes a little more time at the beginning especially, don't don't be frustrated or concerned that it's taking a little more time. When they not are no longer relying on you as much, it, they have to go, oh, I have to pay attention now and I have to give more effort now. When you also ask students to take out their sight reading, you might be faced with the audible groan or the eye rolls of, oh, oh here we go, uh, sight reading, oh, great. This is an issue, in my opinion, if you don't sight read it, sight read on a regular basis, and the expectation is we're gonna sight read every day, then it's more likely that you're gonna be met with that, oh, sight reading, ugh, you know. But maybe that's your case. Maybe you sight read every day and you just tell that during the warm-up time, they're really not engaged, they're not excited to be here. So I encourage you to use positive self-talk. And you say, repeat after me, I love to sight read. I'm great at sight reading. I'm so thankful Dr. Bland allows us to sight read, right? That we are saying, I enjoy this, I'm good at this, and that we kind of have this positive attitude towards sight reading instead of, oh, here we go. One of the worst things we can do is say, all right, 
let's get through this exercise so we can get to our rehearsal music. Well, the problem with that, that gives the connotation that the sight reading is a chore and we'll just, we just need to get through it so we can get to something else, right? And that's kind of the wrong approach to go. Just be mindful of the language you use towards sight reading. All right, you do this right, we can get to our rehearsal music. Again, that gives the connotation that it's a, it's a punishment, it's a chore that we have to do, but we get to sight read, and I'm excited to sight read. Lastly, I want to share with you some techniques for um, including solfege in your repertoire music. There's two different opinions about when you sight read your music, your repertoire music. Do you have students write in the solfege or not? There are some teachers, many teachers out there that say you never write in any solfege in the music, right? I am mixed on that. I understand why you don't do that, but your repertoire music should be more difficult than the sight reading. You should never write in solfege in the sight reading material, but in your repertoire music, it should be more difficult than sight reading. And so they need some support. And so I take a middle ground. I don't have them write in every syllable and I have very specific uh, expectations on how they write in the solfege. So as you see in this slide, I have them write it in right in front of the note head. Many times students put it above or below the staff. There is more space there, understandably, usually above because there's no text there. They put it above the staff. The problem is when they read that music during rehearsal, they don't read the, the notes. They're reading their solfege that they've written in. And so when you place it right in front of the note head, they have to look at both the note and the solfege that's been written in. The next thing I require of students is that they write only what they need. Sometimes you'll see students write do, 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 so, 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 so. And they're writing all five do's and all five so's. You don't need to write all of those in, right? You need to write one do, one so, that's it. The same can be said when you have something like do, re, mi. We don't need to write re and mi. That should be very simple. It's a stepwise motion. You just write in do, that's it. Okay, well maybe we have a skip to T. Do, re, mi, T. Okay, we'll write in the T. And from there on, you know, what do you need to, to write in? So requiring them to do those things really helps with the process and sight reading your repertoire music uh, while giving them a little bit of support. Again, I hope that you include these techniques in sight reading and solfege in all aspects of the rehearsal, the warm up, a dedicated daily sight reading time, and sight read your rehearsal repertoire as they're learning it, uh, as that's the purpose of sight reading, that we can read music. Uh, and so I hope you find these suggestions helpful as you continue to teach sight, readings, sight reading and your students develop their skills in solfege and sight reading. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope you continue to inspire the future leaders of our world through this wonderful gift we call music. Thanks.